So Ilya and I decided that we're going to waste the next 15 minutes of your life starting now. Oh, that's easier than I thought. Yeah, I was nervous. I'm glad it's over. What are you doing later? I don't know. <laughs> Wait, are we going to do the entire 15 minutes like that? Well, I mean, it kind of proves the point, right? Yeah, but we can tell him the point, you know, with words. You want me to use words? Yeah. All right, fine. fine. So Nathaniel and I are going to talk about the class that we teach together, and also a student-led program that we initiated. Both of them gesture towards gifting students with time and space to imagine possibilities, and also to show respect for varying and creative way that people think. And this is what we think as a steamy education. Yes, it is quite steamy. Ilya and I believe that we need to throw out the model where answers are valued above all else, questions are a close second, and very little else matters. The reason why most of the best scientific discoveries in history are called discoveries is precisely because they weren't found when going from just one place to another, but rather discovered when we were meandering. We believe that our current education systems need to value forms of nonspecific knowledge, things that just happen and are discovered slowly and through activity. So in the product realization course that we teach, we bring students and from different backgrounds, engineering and artists and designers, and they work on developing a working prototype of a, of a solution for a problem that is based on a real industry problem. And they do it in the course of one semester. Local industry companies buy in, they give students a budget, and they give students directions and design brief for what they want to build. So we give the students benchmarks, supervision, and a whole lot of resources to get the job done. It's true that they're asked to build something specific by the end of the semester, but the process we've developed is unique in a number of ways. Mostly, it's that we actually want them to go off the beaten path as a part of what they do. Here's one. Ilya, how many performance artists does it take to screw in a light bulb? Uh, I don't know, Nathaniel. How many? I, well, I don't know either, because I actually left after seven hours. <laughs> That's never gets old. Yeah, it never gets old. The point is that performance art takes time because the outcomes are unknown. Sometimes there are no outcomes in a traditional sense, but wasting time is never just a waste of time, even if Ilya and I are wasting yours. If we want to discover new things, exploratory time like that taken by performance art needs to be valued more. But Nathaniel, at the university, and you know it very well, we have to write papers, we have to write research grant proposals, sometimes business plans, and we have to map everything we are going to do before we actually do it. Sometimes we get the work done before we actually start anything. And it's really unfortunate because the whole point of mapping is to go into uncharted territory. As philosopher Brian Masumi says, if you know exactly where you're going to go when you start, and that's the only place you go, you haven't actually gone anywhere. In our opinion, innovation requires time to go places we didn't know existed. Despite the, what we assume at TED Talks, Innovation does not happen in 15-minute intervals in front of the audience. It's not Nathaniel and I telling you what innovation is. Maybe just a little. Maybe just a little bit. What we're seeing or hearing about at TED Talks or quick pitch sessions is just the tip of an iceberg. It's a result of a very long process. What we see is the product of the last three months of a grant that was given for one year after only 15 years of research that was done prior to that. And it's very rare that our educational system or even corporate models allow for that kind of time. They're all pitch-based. They're all outcomes-based. They're all utilitarian. What can I have tomorrow? What's the fastest way to get there? I can hear my New York mom in the background saying, Nathaniel. Hi, mom. <laughs> Hi, mom. Nathaniel, all you want is instant gratification. It's not healthy. <laughs> Hi, mom. And I have, to, I have to agree with Nathaniel's mom. <laughs> it's the first time to... for everything. Yes, it's true. <laughs> so once we agree on something, <laughs> we have to get away from these patterns with our students. And this is where product realization course that was mentioned by our colleague Mike Lovell comes into play. Through the studies of all our student teams, we found out that the most successful teams are not the ones who are the most skilled, not the ones who are most intelligent, the, the most creative or the most uh, experienced, but rather the ones who have time to meet the most, the ones who work together and work together well. And so the class starts, I kid you not, with the oh-so-creative Schedule Compatibility Survey. I love it. <laughs> we base our teams almost exclusively on how often they can meet and for how long. We make sure that they have time together to build relationships, to build trust, to brainstorm with their sponsors, for learning about each other's working methods and learning to respect the talents that each brings to the table. So imagine telling this to an engineering student. You are not allowed to build anything for half of the semester. 
You're not allowed to tinker with the prototypes. You're not allowed to use computer-aided design software, not even play with the Photoshop. But instead, you have to sketch as many ideas and possibilities as you can. And when you reach the bottom of the barrel, find a new barrel. How many of you are familiar with the story of Frederick August Kukuli and the benzene molecule? Don't answer that. It's actually a rhetorical question. <laughs> Good, thank you. So uh, Kukule and many of his colleagues couldn't figure out how the benzene molecule was shaped, how the individual atoms related to one another on a, a micro scale. It turns out that it's not actually a, a, a linear molecule that has a beginning and end, but a never-ending circle of bits. And Kukule could only figure this out after not only a decade and a half of studying carbon-carbon bonds, but when he was daydreaming around his lab and thinking of snakes that had their own tails in their mouth. So the story has a point. Little the one. point of the story is that innovation takes time. We cannot give years to our students, but we can show them the values of daydreaming, the values of playing, the values of sketching and trying different things. And we let them think of things that they didn't know they can think of. So they're not asked to illustrate existing ideas, but actually forced to sketch as a mode of thought. When you have to come up with hundreds of sketches, you begin to think about concepts that you didn't even think you could think. You fold in ideas from and with and as the world around you. You think about snakes and clouds, time machines and rabbit holes. You draw on and draw out potentials that you didn't know were there. So we're going to give you an example of this process. You know sometimes you're waiting for a sandwich in a deli or a sandwich shop. And usually, the delay is caused by the people who prepare your food to put in gloves on and off. They don't want to contaminate your food because they're dealing with money as well. So one of our student teams tackled this problem. Through a series of sketches, no prototyping, no CAD design, they combined the clothes hanger, the plastic uh, bag dispensers, and the perforated strips into a system that allows you to put the gloves on in half a second without contaminating the glove. Teams never build their first or second or even 15th idea and often surprise themselves with what they accomplish. Only when three quarters of the semester is done are they actually allowed to quantify their concepts and combine several of them into a finished prototype. In addition to time, innovation needs space. And I don't necessarily mean physical space. Innovation needs space to build trust with your collaborators. Innovation needs space <laughs> to learn how other people think and trust them and believe in them. Engineers, us, for example, we solve problems. Designers, they usually define problems. And artists, well, artists, they create problems. I hate what I meant to say, they problematize. Yeah. Yes, we problematize. What Ilya means here is that artists don't simply ask questions or provide answers, but we, we try to guide the world towards propositions of what could be. Sometimes. It's not just enough to define a problem and then try to clear it up. Sometimes there's a lot of value to be found in exploring areas where there are no questions that can yet be articulated. And this brings us to disciplinary thinking. Discipline is not a medium or a material. Discipline is actually a mode of thought. And several people are capable of different modes of thinking, but almost none is capable of working in different modes and very rare can work and think in different disciplines. Certainly not at once. And so true interdisciplinarity on a given project, therefore in an IRA plenian, requires collaboration and the space that such work together needs. It requires a respect and understanding for the otherness of thought. So Nathaniel, for example, in addition to his art studio degree, has a PhD from an engineering department. He definitely speaks engineer, as you can see from this picture. Yeah, for my sins. And uh, Ilya speaks certain kinds of culture uh, and art and music. Can I say foreign engineer? Yeah, you can say foreign I can say foreign engineer. We're not disciplined in the same way, but we can speak across and with one another. We understand each other's otherness, and so we work together very well, in parallel very well, most of the time. So we model this for our students. We let them work together in a certain way such that it amplifies their unique strengths. So we let them do jigsaw puzzles, play with Legos, present to each other, or sit together around the table and brainstorm hundreds of different concepts. So for example, what could you do with a cereal box? A cereal box is, according to our students, a place to keep my stuff, a straight line for drawing, a nuclear power source, Tinder, ice skates, a nice dress, an iron, a web server, a leaf blower, some roughage, or my favorite, a laxative. Why is it your favorite? <laughs> I'm feeling a little sick today, actually. It's a rhetorical question. <laughs> so we also believe that tests 
is not the way to nurture or even test different intelligences. It is a reward and punishment system, and it only rewards those who are good in instrumental thinking or memorization. <laughs> what we have to do is we have not to discard the best potential of thinkers and makers, and not reward only those who are good at scoring the best exam. Instead, students present their progress on a bi-weekly basis. They're taught to, be taught to be conversational, to joke with one another, to ask questions, to provoke new ideas, to dance and think on their feet, to feel safe in failing, <laughs> to rely on one another's strengths and shortcomings in the class as a whole towards productive ends. And so mostly it's play a lot, move very slowly, and don't build anything until the very end. So the product realization course is an example how interdisciplinary thinking can be taught, but most importantly, practiced at the university setting. In four years, our students have completed almost 50 successful projects. But more than that is that we've developed artists who speak engineer and engineers who speak art. We have articulate performing designers who respect both the work and thought of others and the time and space required to work together. So last year, we thought that we could actually use this class to let our students develop their own products and explore their own ideas. We found out that the skills that we are teaching in our class are very similar to entrepreneurial skills needed to create a business. So we decided to add an element of risk and also take the class one step further. With the help of Brian Thompson, the president of UWM Research Foundation, the UWM Student Startup Challenge was born. I feel like Brian looks a little bigger in projection. He does, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, that's him over there. He's smaller than up here. <laughs> this is a two semester program designed to help students execute their own innovative ideas. It's a fairly rigorous competition in order to get the job done, but it's not like any other we've seen. We actually do not want a business plan. Just what is it? Who will use it? What will they use it for? That's it. The university is granted absolutely no stake in the company whatsoever. This is about investing in the students. The business actually need not succeed. The product need not succeed. The team and its members are given time and space to fail, to meander, to imagine. And we believe that this will eventually breed some form of success. It's not about short-term profits. This is a long-term educational investment. So this is how it works. In the first semester, the winning team gets a team of students from a product realization course to develop a prototype. And in the second semester, the winning team works with another student group from a commercialization class to develop a business model, intellectual property management plan, and investor-ready pitch. Each inventor team has five to $10,000 to achieve these two milestones in two semesters. So the pilot program, which was just this year, we selected three teams and three prototypes that were developed in product realization from over 60 submissions. The first was 3D Creations, who used a front-facing camera and structured light to make a tabletop 3D scanner that is less than one-third the cost and more than three times the resolution of its closest competitor. The second team, Parking Unwired, developed a portable, self-powered, internet-connected hardware that counts cars. So you can deploy it in a festival, in a parking lot, on the surface, or anywhere you want. It helps us to find parking easier, and it also helps parking lot owners to make more money. And the third team, Cleverblocks, is actually working on developing a whole series of new interfaces for computer-aided design. Their first, my favorite, is actually smart Legos, so that we can collaboratively build structures in the physical world, and it develops real-time computer models on our desktop. So three different projects, three different products, but one common thing that all the student teams started with a few simple ideas, and through the course of working on these projects, they had to change and they had to adapt over time. Um, all of them are familiar with failure already. In fact, we've had a breakup in one of our teams. And it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. But our students have already learned the value of failure and of finding the right collaborators. And so they picked up their toys, came up with another idea, formed another team, and have already won another competition here based in Milwaukee to the tune of $5,000. Every single one of the teams is already starting to make a difference in thinking and making culture here in Milwaukee. So what's happening this year? This year, we're tripling the number of teams that we'd like to support. With the help of our new partner, Michael Hostet, we're adding another class that helps students to build mobile apps in addition to hardware. So there's uh, a few things we'd like you to take away from this talk, but we're going to be explicit about three of them. So first, there's enough rewards and prizes for those who excel in the excellent system of utility and capital. But we're missing out on the great potential of young, talented makers and thinkers. We have to dedicate our resources to create fertile grounds for those 
who think, who make things. And we need to create time to think, to learn, to operate. But most importantly, we need to create space where they can play, they can joke around, they can fail, and more importantly, they can try again. Second, we have to stop training specialists in specific fields alone and start training interdisciplinary collaborators who appreciate all modes of thought. Our Startup Challenge is not just about making business plans and businesses that succeed and profit in the short term. It is a long-term investment in training entrepreneurs who know how to work with others. And third, we hear all the time that we need to take, give our, uh, our students chances to fail and to try different things. It's, a, it's some, some, somewhat of a cliche, but we punish them when they fail. So we need to give them those chances to take. We need to compliment them for the risks they take, even when those risks do not heed the results that we were hoping for, or in fact, when they heed no results at all, to look for the unexpected over time. We need to put them on a team of diverse thinkers, stick them in a room, give them seven hours to change a light bulb, and say, pay no attention to the light bulb. So we hear a lot that you never know until you try. But in our opinion, for true innovation to occur, we have to actually look for things that we didn't even try for. Just imagine the world we'd live in if we spent more time imagining the world we could live in. That's what we're striving for. Thank you. Thank you.